Well, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with our morning service here at Sidewell Road. We're great, grateful to see each one of you here today. Uh, glad that those that are online are able to join us as well. I'll have a few announcements prior to the service beginning. Let's keep Eric Davis and Regina Clower in our prayers. Eric has broken his leg. Please continue to keep Eric and Regina in your prayers through his recovery and as Regina cares for him. So we know the situation that Eric's in. So, you know, him breaking his leg makes it a tough situation for Regina and them to take care of him. So let's reach out to him, ask him if there's something that we can do for him and continue to keep him in our prayers as well. Uh, Breland West, a friend of Tim Butler's, is having some problems with her pregnancy. Please keep Breland and the baby in your prayers. Tim's requested this for his friends, so let's remember them. Melvin Logan, a family member of Bill Patrick, has passed away. Keep this entire family in your prayers. We all know, you know, this is a tough situation whenever someone loses someone, so let's continue to rem remember the Melvin Logan family. Ernest Longstreet has been having some health issues as well. And please continue to keep Nita Hart in your prayers. She's having health problems. We know Miss Nita's, you know, been trying, she tries to get to church when she can, and her and Jerry, and Jerry's trying to take care of her. So let's continue to remember Miss Nita. Uh, Virginia Morris fell and broke her hip. She had surgery on Monday. I'll update a little bit on that. She's moving to rehab. Uh, this morning, matter of fact, so we're going to get her in there. She took a couple of steps. She's trying to put some weight on her on her legs. So we are moving in a positive direction. So continue prayers for mom and dad and our family. I would appreciate that. Uh, Laretha Wallace also asked for prayers. She had to go to the hospital yesterday due to some blood sugar problems. So let's continue to remember all these in our prayers. Some of these are in our announcement sheets as well. And Derek does a great job of sending out messages to us as who should be on the prayer list and who is needing prayers and, and things like that have come up. Congratulations to Hiram Christie for our new grandbaby. The... Seven pound, eight ounce baby boy, Logan Caleb Nichols, was born this past week to Brandon and Hope. They said Hope is doing well and the baby is well also, so congratulations to them. All right, as we begin our services this morning, let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the church worldwide. We thank you for the church here at Sidewell Road and the things that we do to try to spread your word throughout our community and throughout our state and throughout the world through the missionaries that we support. We're grateful for all the souls that have been touched and are saved through these efforts that we make. We ask that you continue to be with the eldership here at Sidewell Road, that you will give us strength and knowledge to carry this church forward in the truth, we ask that you be with the deacons as they serve here and the areas that they serve in. We ask that you continue to have members reach out to them, that we can all be involved in the things going here on here at Sidewell Road. We're thankful for each member that is present here this morning and those that are able to be with us online as well. We were thankful for the time that we had in our Bible class this morning to be able to open your word and to be able to dig deeper so that we know how to live our lives according to what you have placed in front of us to do, Lord, so that our ultimate goal is to get to heaven together as a church, as a family. Continue to be with us as we father our service, bless us as we lift up our prayers, as we sing and commune together. We're grateful that you are in our presence and we are humbled to that fact that we will lift all this up in the glory to your name. We ask that you be with Gary as he brings us the message today. Continue to be with Derek and Ed as they work with us. 
We ask that you continue to be with those that have been displaced by the tor recent tornadoes in Arkansas and here in Mississippi, that that's going to be a long time recovery for them. And we ask you that you watch over them and give them the needs that they need if the church reaches out to them for the needs that they have. Most of all, we're thankful for Jesus and the cross and what it means to each one of us. Continue to bless us as we present our worship this morning that we give you all the glory, and it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First song will be 483 in your book, 483. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm going to hide behind these flowers. <laughs> if you would, please stand for number 483. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. <clears throat> Stand up, stand up. Jesus. 
Good morning. Today's scripture reading will come from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. I'll be reading from the American Standard Version. Luke 23, 44 to 49. And it was now about the sixth hour, and a darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun's light failing, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what, what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this man was a righteous man. And all the multitudes that came together to this sight, when they beheld the things that were done, returned, smiting their breasts. And all his acquaintance and the, and the women that followed with him from Galilee stood afar off, seeing these things. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come today. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine that, that we can enjoy. Thank you for the rain yesterday that, that makes things grow. Father, thank you for this church. And thank you for each member present today. Thank you for our leadership, our ministers, our preachers, uh, the deacons, and each member. Please be with us as we, as we continue to do your will. Please be with <clears throat> the... Please be with us as, as we go about doing your work here at Sywell. We thank you for the law enforcement, the first responders. Thank you for the military. Please be with them as they protect our country. Please be with us. Help us to support them. Father, please be with the sick of our congregation. Please be with Breland West, Melvin Logan, Virginia Morris. Ernest Longstreet, please be with Nathan Brewer and, and Ms. King, please be with Ms. Ms. Hart, help, help us to do what we can for them. Please be, also be with Eric and Ms. Regina, she takes care of him, help us to reach out to them and, and uh, help them, they need help. Father, please be with us as we continue this service, thank you for all that you do for us, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Our next song will be number 365, 365, Nearer, Still, Nearer. We will sing the first and fourth verse. First and fourth verse. <clears throat>
7080280. If you would like to mark a hymn of invitation, it will be number 707. Song of invitation will be number 707. <coughs> number 280. If you would, please stand. joy to be here today and we're certainly thankful we've got visitors uh, in our midst as we often do and we are thankful that you're here we hope you're going to come back be with us again uh, we count it a joy and a privilege that you've come to be with us today 
And of course, to honor the Lord, because that's ultimately what we're all striving to do. If you are a visitor, we ask you to do two things if you're willing. One, take one of those uh, relatively tall cards from the seat in front of you, fill that out, and hand that to a member or someone. I'll be glad to take it. Uh, we just like to have a record of your having been here. But number two, and this is more important, stick around just a little bit after the closing prayer. We want to get to know you, and uh, hopefully you'll want to come back and be with us again at some point in the very near future. Uh, I think we, 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 I like to pause every now and then and make reference to something. Uh, if you reach the age of 80 and you're willing to have that publicized, I let people know it. Uh, today, uh, we have a new 91-year-old in our audience. As of Thursday, Terrell Morris is 91 years old. I think that Jeff's planning to take him for his driver's test on Monday. <laughs> oh, we love you, Terrell. It's good to have you in the audience. And, and uh, you're in prayers, a lot of prayers, not, not just mine. Many, many people uh, praying for you. I'm going to make a comment that, uh, that uh, ordinarily I don't make a lot of comments about. Last night I went to Crystal Springs and, and Derek did a tremendous job uh, delivering the Word of God. I promise you, I've told many people this, they've asked me, what about your co-worker? I said, he can preach for any church in this brotherhood and do a good job. I just hope he stays right here. I don't want him to go anywhere else. I, I love being around him. He's a great uh, man to work with, but he's in a great family, uh, but a really good preacher. He's, he is a fine one, and I'm thankful for that. If you think about the sayings of Jesus on the cross, and you really, really study on it for just a little bit, I believe that those sayings serve in certain senses to be a review of his life. We began several weeks ago by talking about, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, I very well understand that he was speaking in reference to that audience at that time. I also believe that we need to recognize that's why he came to earth. But so that not just that group, but any individual who is willing to turn his life around can be forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. If you go to the next statement that he made on the cross, you'll discover that he said, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And while I do not know when you will die or when I will die, I think all of our goal is to be with Jesus that that is a blessing that he, again, came here to make available to all those who are willing to submit to him. And then he made that statement that is, to me, maybe the most haunting of all the statements that he made on the cross, and maybe in all of Scripture, when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When I hear that, I come to a reminder a reminder of the fact that he was not forsaken because of anything he did. He was forsaken because of what I would do. He was forsaken because he bore the sins of all mankind willingly on the cross. And it's for that very reason that at every service when we come together, we like to give an opportunity to those who are present to reach out to the extended hand of Jesus. He died for you. But if you do not choose to live for Him, if you do not choose to repent of your sins and put Him on in penitent baptism, then unfortunately His blood is of no value to you. Jesus died for us. And then we came to two statements that in some ways go together. The first is, I thirst. He demonstrated in that his humanity. He understands us. He knows what it's like to hurt, to suffer, to do without. And you hear that in his simple statement, and yet such a powerful thought, I thirst. 
But before John wrote that statement down, he noted that all things were finished, that everything had been fulfilled. And so the I thirst passage goes very well with the next statement that he made, which is, it is finished. He's done what he came to do. He came to finish out the law of Moses, to fulfill every prophecy that had been made about him, and in certain senses because of that, about us. It is now finished. He is, is prepared to die. He's going to give up his life, but when he does... The law of Moses will be totally fulfilled, and as an active law, it will be nailed to the cross, never to be active anymore in the lives of any people. Now today, we come to the last statement that he made while on the cross. You heard it read a few moments ago very well uh, from Luke chapter 23, and it's a simple and yet also a powerful statement, and it is, Father... Into your hands I commend my spirit. Within that statement are three very, very valuable lessons that we do not want to overlook. The first, Jesus entrusted his future to God. He put his future in the hands of his Father. We heard it. It actually is a direct quote of David's comments In the Psalms, Psalm chapter 31, verse 5, when he said, Into your hand I commit my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. David knew he could trust God. You think about it, even as a little boy, a young man, when he was a shepherd boy that went to visit his brothers out on the battlefield, and when Goliath came forth and challenged Not just the armies of God, he challenged the living God. And when he did that, you remember what David said? Basically, I can whip him. How are you going to do it, David? It's easy. God protected me when the lion came up against my flocks or when the bear came up against my flocks, and he'll protect me from this uncircumcised Philistine. What's the point? You can put your trust in God. He will not let you down. David knew that. And Jesus reflects it on the cross of Calvary when he cries this out at the very end of his life. I love the statement of uh, Anthony Ashe in his commentary. I want to just share it with you. He says, his words from Psalm 31.5 were a night prayer learned by Jews from childhood. Now, think about this. You know, the prayer you probably are familiar with in this country is, now I lay lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Well, all Jewish children, as children, learned to pray this prayer as they went to sleep. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, you think about that. Is that not a wonderful, peaceful way to to pillow your head at night? To pillow your head and say, God, I'm giving you charge over my spirit. I'm going to be able to sleep the sleep of a baby because I know you're going to take care of me. And that's what Jesus is saying as he gets ready to enter into the sleep of death. He's praying that exact prayer at the final assault of Satan, when everything seemed to be lost, Jesus committed himself to God. When the battle seemed to have gone totally to the side of the devil, Jesus knew it had not. I trust you, Lord, my God, my Father. I give you my spirit. We need to learn from that the impact of that statement on other people is remarkable. You heard it read just a few moments ago. Listen again to verse 47. When we find, so when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now I've got to ask a question, and maybe you've already come to an answer in your mind. What was it? that made him come to that conclusion. 
Think about the cross for a minute. Did Jesus face the cross like any other person ever crucified? I doubt it. He began with asking for his father's forgiveness for the very people that hung him there. He expressed nothing but trust in his father, as we've just seen. He talked about paradise. And think about what's going on around him. Darkness for three hours. Middle of the day. Darkness. And then the earthquake and the tombs opening. This was a righteous man. That's not the only reaction. Look at the next verse, verse 48. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. Hmm. Is this the beginning of what would happen on Pentecost? They have let the religious leaders convince them that they ought to cry out for the death of this man. They have caused him to go to the cross. They caused the shedding of his blood. And as he dies, they beat on their breasts a sign in, under Jewish system, a sign of sorrow, of suffering. Why are they suffering? They caused him to be crucified. Could it be? Could it be that the door is already beginning to swing open? So that they ultimately would cry out on Pentecost and say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they heard the answer, didn't they? Repent. Turn away from what you've done in the past. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It had an impact on other people. But could I suggest it ought to have an impact on us? That every one of us needs to learn to do what Jesus did. That we need to learn to entrust our souls, our spirits, to God Almighty. The Apostle Paul expressed it so well in his second letter to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 12. We said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him to that day. Do you know who you've believed? Have you believed the Lord? Do you recognize that he truly can keep safe, that word keep meaning guard, that he can guard your spirit until the day of judgment, that he can deliver you home to a great heavenly abode? If you believe that, then you ought to be speaking like Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus entrusted his future to God, but Jesus also offered a sacrifice that was voluntary. Voluntary. Look to the book of John, if you will. This is the great 10th uh, chapter, which is really a chapter on the, uh, the shepherding of Jesus, where he talks about the good shepherd, and he's talking about himself uh, when he does that. Pick up at verse 11, where he makes this statement. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Watch the word. He gives his life. This is not somebody takes it from him. In fact, he's going to talk about that in just a few verses from now. Nobody's taking it from him. He gives his life. He loves the sheep. He's willing to die so that the sheep can be preserved. That's the idea that is in this place. Go on down. Verse 15. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Listen to him again. I lay down my life.
For what? Not for some political idea. Not for some uh, martyrdom that would, would lead to lots and lots of people following you. No, no, no. I lay down my life for the sheep. That's for you and me. That's for us. I go on down and pick up again at verse 17. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Look at that. I lay down my life over and over and over again. He's saying, I give it. I give it. It's voluntary. I'm choosing to do it. Not somebody making him to do it. You may very well remember what we're going to look at in just a few moments. But first, observe verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. I lay it down. Jesus repeatedly lets us know that it is a voluntary act on his part. A voluntary act that was committed, that he was involved with, because of what? Because of, because of us. Because he wanted to save the sheep. He wanted us to be able to have a home in heaven. That's why in Matthew chapter 26, we find a very powerful thing that happens. You'll remember it. It's when Peter pulled out his sword and cut off the, the ear, the right ear of the high priest's servant. Now listen to the response of Jesus, beginning in verse 52 of Matthew 26. Put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father? And he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Don't you know that if I asked him to, that my Father could send more than seventy-two thousand angels? <laughs> that may not be as powerful to some of you as it ought to be. When David violated the will of God, he took a census toward the end of his life. When he wanted to know how many fighting men he had, he got in trouble, didn't he? God gave him three choices. And do you remember how David responded to that? I don't want to be put in, under the power of my enemies. I'm just going to lay it at God's feet. You choose. God sent an angel, one angel, and thousands upon thousands of the fighting men of Israel were put to death that day. One angel. What do you think 72,000 could have done? Wipe the world out. Nobody could have stood up to Jesus. When he says, I lay down my life, it's all the more powerful. We know that he didn't have to. He did it by choice. He did it because he loved us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. The writer's talking about a, a comparison between the, the Old Testament high priest and Jesus as the ultimate high priest. And here's what he says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That was why he did it. That's why he laid down his life. Because he wanted you. He wanted me. He wanted everyone to have the opportunity to be set free from their sins. Jesus entrusted his future to God. Jesus' sacrifice was voluntary. But then also, notice, Jesus knew he would live on. 
Maybe we don't quite see this, but it's important that we do. Go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, and hear the wise preacher of the Old Testament when he arrives in chapter 12 at the very conclusion of his writing. And here's a part of what he says in verses 6 and 7. Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Some of you have heard me refer to this on other occasions. My mother is a fairly young girl. Uh, used to have to go to the funeral home to take clean white shirts to her brothers because a body had to be picked up. and They had to be dressed a certain way. I, my suspicion is she learned this on those days. Because she'd go in there, and of course, funeral homes have sometimes many bodies that are in them. And maybe her brothers taught her, maybe her dad did, I don't know. But I can tell you that at the death of my dad, when we went to view his body, all the way down that aisle, she said it again and again, he's not here. This is just a body. He's not here. Into thy hands, I commend my spirit. The body is going to go into the grave, but the spirit is going to God. In the book of James, chapter 2, James is talking about the faith and works and the importance of the two being together. In fact, he's illustrating that, that faith without works really is not alive at all. If, Listen to how he did it in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The body without the spirit is dead. We don't lay men's spirits in the ground. This is the thing that the atheists of our era, and of all previous eras for that matter, misunderstand and mistake. This is not the end. This world is not the finish of it all. The spirit that is in me, the spirit that is in you is going to live on. Jesus understood that. The apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 actually alluded to this at least twice. First, as he quotes from David's prophecy, and in verse 27 of Acts 2, he says, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. There is within that reference a clear understanding in the mind of Christ. And that is that his body was going into the ground. And that if under ordinary circumstances that body went into the ground, then beginning on at least the fourth day, it would begin to decay. It would begin to rot. It would begin to stink. But the spirit, the spirit was going to the Hadean realm. It was going to the waiting place of the dead. And he, he knows that. He's well aware of it because David wrote about it before. But what actually happened? Well, the spirit... Went to Hades, all right. It went to paradise. The body, did it begin to decay? The answer to that is not if it had to be the fourth day. Because as you read on in verse 31 of Acts chapter 2, you'll hear Peter say, He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. He did not stay in the tomb. Nothing is more powerful in reference to that than the statement of the angel when, when the l women came to the tomb and, they, and the angel said, What? He is not here. He is risen.
He knew it wasn't over. There was something ahead. Friends, it's important for us to realize we are going to live on as well. Death's not the end. It's only a transition. We've got to see that. Look at John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, where we hear Jesus saying to his apostles, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. I wish that there were some way for a feeble human like me to cause every mind, if only for a moment, to focus on this fact. You're going to live on. Well, death's real. If you've lived to be very old at all, you know that. You've been to the funeral home, you've been to the cemetery probably more times than you ever thought about or ever dreamed of, wanted to go. You didn't want to go, but you've been again and again and again. But that's not the end. That one that is put in the earth will one day come forth. And when you and I, when our bodies are put into the earth, we too, one day, will come forth. The question is not, will I live again? The question I wish everybody here today would ask themselves is this, where will I live again? Heaven? That's the ideal. Hell? The undesirable. Where will I live again? Look at 2 Thessalonians. The Thessalonian Christians knew there'd be a resurrection. Now, it took the first letter to convince them there'd be a resurrection of the dead. They now knew that, but they feared, apparently, that the dead, wicked people would be with them in eternity. And so now Paul writes to them to correct that misunderstanding. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning of verse 7. He says, and to give you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, what's he coming for? The main focus of his coming is not to punish the wicked. I didn't say they won't be punished. I said that's not his main focus. What is his main focus? Paul gives it to us. To be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Jesus is coming back to take his people home. Doesn't that just give you chills? coming back to take his people home. That's why he's coming back. You and I are going to live on. Our end is out there somewhere in terms of this life, but our eternal end, oh no, it's not there at all. It's in the future. We'll live forever. No wonder Paul wrote like he did in the great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning of verse 50, when he said, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's the message for the church. My question is, is is it a message for you? 
Jesus came to the end of his life and he entrusted himself to God, his Father. Jesus sacrificed voluntarily because, at least in part, he knew that it wasn't over. That there was yet something in his future. You can know, and hopefully do by today at least, that something's in your future. The question is, what is it? Jesus died so that it could be nothing but good. It waits for you if you'll yield to him by coming as we sing.
Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come here this morning as a family and gather around this table to partake of this bread, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we partake of this bread that we can think back to the cross, think back to the perfect sacrifice that was given to us on that day, Lord. Lord, I pray that we can take this bread that represents the flesh that was shed on the cross for our sins, and we can do it for well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Lord, as we're still gathered around this table, Lord, Lord, I pray that we can still look back at the cross, Lord, at the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins, Lord, Lord, I pray that we can partake of this cup that resembles the blood that was poured on the cross for our sins so that we can have an eternal life with you, Lord, I pray that we can do this and well please in your sight. In Jesus' name we humbly pray, amen.
While we're still gathered here this morning <clears throat> around this table, uh, let's go ahead and continue in prayer for the offering. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you, Lord. Thank you for everything that you so richly bless us with. Lord, we pray that we can open up our hearts, Lord, and give back a portion that we've been so richly blessed with, Lord. Lord, I pray that we can take this money that we're collect here today and spread it throughout your kingdom, Lord. Lord, that we can uh, we can spread help spread your word throughout this world, Lord. Lord, I pray that we can do this and well pleased in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, it was good to have every, everyone here this morning to be able to worship God together. That is our ultimate goal, was to be together. I have a few announcements of upcoming events. Uh, blast night is Wednesday night, April 19th, after evening service. Outside work day, Saturday, April 22nd at 8 a.m. We would use some help trying to get things straightened up outside, uh, we could appreciate all anyone that could show up on that day, April 22nd, 8 a.m. Sunday night, April 23rd, after evening service, we will be having our annual Last of Leaders Banquet after services on the 23rd. The entire congregation is invited to stay and celebrate these children and their families and congratulate them on the job well done. Everyone is asked to bring finger foods. Community Outreach Day, door knocking. April 29th starts at 10 a.m. All these are in your announcement sheet as well, so, and I'm sure that, you know, Derek will be sending things out online to remind us as well. Gospel meeting, equipping the saints, faith in the family, here at Sidewell Road, April 30th May through May 3rd, 23rd. Guest speakers, Mark Teske, this will be during our regular worship times on that Sunday. On Monday through Wednesday, we will meet each night at 6.30 p.m., Monday through Thursday, 6.30 p.m. Invite your friends and family, as many people as we can get, to come to the gospel meeting. It would be great. Car group number three meets tonight. Group leaders Sam Clark and Jeff Seal. Gary, it was a good lesson. We appreciate you. Well, you know, as a church here, we make sure that the truth is taught here, and we appreciate Gary and his efforts. And Derek, our ultimate goal as a church here at Sidewell Road is to be together with God and his people. And Gary, let us know that today, that Jesus came and has risen, and that's where our ultimate goal is, is to be in heaven. So we appreciate that lesson today. Let us stand for the closing song and closing prayer. Number 480, 480, Soldiers of Christ Arise, 480. Soldiers of Christ Arise.
Please go ahead and be seated for the time being. Uh, I have a quick announcement that I need to make. The elders have graciously allowed me this time to give you a quick report about our Lads to, we Lads to Leaders Convention weekend we had last weekend. We appreciate all of the prayers and thoughts that you sent our way. It was a blessing for us to be up there with several members of the Brotherhood and to listen to our young men and women speak and show their, stu their knowledge of God. Quick recap for Lads to Leaders. This year our theme was Rise Up and Build. It came from Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 17 and 18. I'm going to read an excerpt of chapter of uh, verse 18. When then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. And what a good work we had. We had over 17,000 participants at Lads to Leaders in Nash across the nation this year. In Nashville itself, we had 9,100. The Opryland Hotel was made up of 94% of their capacity was Lads to Leaders participants. Our color division, which was red, had 2,131, and on the Sunday morning worship, it is estimated that there were 6, 000, over 6,000 in attendance on Sunday. This, our congregation itself, we brought 55 people, uh, including young uh, kids and parents and grandparents. We had a great time supporting our, our young ones and, in continue, and uh, worshiping. Trinity Freeman on Friday night took cleaned out the house. She had third place in podcasting, third place in painting, and gold, a gold medal in year-round songs of praise. Saturday night, Emma Broom took third place in songs of praise for her age category. Our third and fourth grade Bible Bowl team made finalists. That was Josh Broom, Jacob Conger, Aniston Dulaney, and Jane Middleton. Our ninth and tenth grade Bible Bowl team made team finalists as well. That's Emma Broom, Brooke Conger, Trinity Freeman, and Tripp Kessler. Within our K through second grade division, we had ten, we had four that made the top ten in the individual Bible Bowl test. That would be Josh Broom, Aniston Dulaney, Cal Dulaney, and Jane Middleton. This year, for the first time in several years, we had a puppet team, and we were really excited about that. Fourth grade puppet theater, third place was Emma Broom, Josh Broom, Darby Carr, Jax Carr, Aniston Dulaney, Cal Dulaney, Crimson Kessler, Tripp Kessler, Liam Middleton, Jane Middleton, and Zach Morris. We had a great time. These kids worked really, had a really, we worked really hard with these kids. These kids worked really hard to perform for, for this. Next Sunday night, I cannot stress this enough, please come to our year-end, our appreciation banquet. A couple of things. You are going to see the Puppet Theater presentation. We are going to be announcing next year's theme. And more, most importantly, because Lads to Leaders is about the training of our youth, we are going to bring, talk about some of our year-round events that we're going to go ahead and kick off next week. And with that, I would like you all to, th once again, thank you all for the prayers and concerns for the Lads to Leaders program, and we will go to our Father in Heaven, and this will dismiss us. Bow with me, please. Most holy and gracious Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, dear Lord, for everything you have blessed us with. We thank you, dear Lord, for this time that we can come together to worship you. We pray, Lord, that as we go through our life in this week, that we keep, the, keep, a, <clears throat> keep in mind the things that we have learned today. We pray, dear Lord, that we be the Christians that you would strive for us to be. We pray, dear Lord, for our young people as they are learning to love you and grow in your name and word. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are ill, that they recover. We pray, dear Lord, for those who are traveling. We thank you, dear Lord, for all the many blessings you have given us. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.